The International Space Station, frequently called the ISS, is a multinational partnership project between five nations to better understand scientific research in a microgravity environment away from Earth's surface. In its 23 years of research-shattering existence, the ISS has seen leaps and bounds made in the evolution of physics, astrobiology, meteorology, and astronomy in space, and has led to better implementation of these industries in all phases of life. It's fair to say that without the International Space Station at our disposal these last two plus decades, our world and our understanding of science at its current degree would look drastically different, and probably for the worst. All that being said, it probably comes with a gut reaction of confusion and melancholy to know that by 2030, the ISS will be nothing but a memory as it descends from orbit and crashes valiantly into the depths of the ocean. It may not all be doom and gloom, however. Like the circle of life goes, with death there is life. And the same rings true for the ISS and its impact on the future of space exploration and scientific evolution. Let's take a look back at the International Space Station, for an understanding of its past will help us see the light at the end of the tunnel that is its demise. Back in the 1980s, in the midst of the Cold War's fumes and at the tail end of the long gestated space race, the United States was seeking to build and launch a long-term space station module into low Earth orbit. At the time, the project titled Freedom was imagined as a rival replay on the Soviet Union's own space stations called Salyut and Mir, rather than a pure research facility to test the limits of microgravity. In 1984, the scientific communities, a part of the European Space Agency, pledged their allegiance to America after the latter party sent the ESA an invitation to join in on the Freedom Program efforts. The same year, the United States sent a similar invitation to the Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Trudeau, in hopes that the Canadian Space Agency would tag alongside the Europeans as well. A year later, in 1985, Japan swiftly agreed to join after receiving an invitation in 1982 with an announcement that their own Japanese experiment module would act as an extension of the original station to be owned and operated by the United States. Another year passed by, and in 1986, Canada finally agreed to the invitation under the newfound leadership of Brian Mulroney. Eventually, the cross-continent plan morphed into the Columbus program as a way to expand upon the original Freedom Space Station. It was a way for both the process in general to speed up, but also to remove fellow global powers from competing with the United States in future years. Unfortunately, the Columbus program was moved to the backburners as global interests slowly migrated from space studies to the ending of the Cold War and disputes in the Middle East. In 1993, after the Soviet Union was dissolved and a democratic Russia was born, then Vice President of the United States, Al Gore, reached out to Russian Prime Minister Viktor Chernomyrdin with hopes to kickstart a new collaborative space module project. Under a new regime, Chernomyrdin agreed to the partnership and the early versions of the International Space Station were created. Canada, the European Space Agency, and Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency were welcomed back to join in on the fun, and the five entities leading the ISS were locked and loaded. The main purpose of the International Space Station was the same in planning and development as it is today. Scientific research, and specifically, scientific research utilising the station's free-fall atmosphere. While the gravity at the ISS's altitude is normally 90% of the gravity on Earth's surface, being in orbit causes everything and everyone aboard the module to appear in a state of weightlessness, or freefall. Astronomers and researchers alike felt like the potential for further discoveries in all realms of science was too great to pass up when planning on the original space station. The ISS was also thought to be the perfect testing site, 
The ISS was also thought to be the perfect testing site for potential long-term projects to be set up on either Mars or the Moon, allowing for the fluctuations of space and space travel at large to be present on tests that would be otherwise impossible on Earth's surface. Both the United States and its global partners thought of the ISS as an additional tool for educational and cultural relations to grow across the world as well. Not only does the International Space Station provide a multitude of videos and demonstrations to educational facilities all over Earth, they are also incredibly forthcoming in sponsoring student-developed research and experiments. In terms of cost, the International Space Station is unofficially regarded as the most expensive solo object in history. After only 12 years in orbit, the ISS program collectively occurred a bill over $150 billion. To break it down even further, if you adjusted the dollar amount per day, using 20,000 person days between 2000 to 2015, and a crew of two six-man teams, you'd have a rate of $7.5 million devoted to the ISS per day. In regards to other mind-blowing statistics, the International Space Station is known to travel around the entire globe in just 90 minutes, averaging a speed of 5 miles per second. The module itself is the second brightest object in the night sky when viewed from Earth, behind only the moon's luminosity by proxy of the sun. On a clear night, you can spot the ISS travelling above without even thinking about a telescope. When you do look up to find the orbiting satellite, remember the International Space Station is about 250 miles away from your placement on Earth and if you were to use a normal spacecraft provided by NASA or a similar agency, you'd reach the ISS in about six hours. Despite the station's enormous size of 357 foot, or the length of a football pitch, it only weighs around 420,000 kilograms or 420 tons. Peggy Whitson, a biochemist and researcher from Beaconsfield, Iowa, occurred the most time spent in the ISS, both living and working full-time, staying put in space for 665 days. She holds the world records for the longest time spent away from Earth by a woman, and a national record for the longest time spent in space by an American. When Peggy was aboard the ISS, she had to work out at least two hours every single day to not drastically lose too much body muscle. Luckily, the ISS came fully equipped with a single gym for all astronauts to use. Other amenities on board were two bathrooms, six quarters for sleeping, and a central bay featuring a 360-degree window for all to see out into the cosmos. As incredible and lavish as life aboard the ISS may seem, it was never meant to last forever. Like all agreements between countries around Earth, partnerships and the relations within them change over time, as do worldwide interests in space exploration. Since the evolution of technology and increase in satellite utilisation, the ISS has quickly become a hotspot for commercial development and the commercialization of low Earth orbit in general. Thus, by the year 2030, the orbital plane occupied by ISS will be totally replaced by the commercial industries. The International Space Station module itself will then be completely emptied by all of its occupants. The interior will be stripped of any relevant, unbroken technology and repurpose it on Earth. For everything else located on the ISS, consisting mostly of scrap metals and unsalvageable tech, it will be depleted of all power sources and come crashing down in a random point on one of Earth's oceans. However, that doesn't mean the end of scientific research in space completely. It is expected that after the ISS module returns home, NASA still has plans on purchasing sectors of the commercial orbit for their own research and experiments. While it won't take up the size or scope of the International Space Station, it will provide NASA with as much real estate as they need. The good news is that with the commercialization of space comes further advancements of technology, science and medicine. Zero G in space actually means lower energy costs as compared to earthly ventures. Not only will this help reduce carbon emissions on Earth, 
It will allow for the mass production of materials incredibly difficult to produce down below to be produced in bulk under zero-g conditions. If you think it's a bad idea, rest assured there has been indisputable proof commercialization of the International Space Station already works. There have been at least 30 commercial facilities aboard the module over the last few years. Some of the revolutionary discoveries made aboard the commercial sectors range from baked goods and culinary arts in space, advancements in electronic recycling, and the development of 3D printing for lunar purposes. If anything, the most exciting prospect of the ISS advancing our presence in low orbit Earth and space beyond is how vital it is habitating locales beyond our home planet. At our current trajectory, Earth is destined to one day be inhabitable, and humankind must have a backup plan to populate space. So while it may sound like all doom and gloom will come in 2030, when we say goodbye to the International Space Station, in its place will reside the promise of innovation, discovery, and the potential saving grace to modern civilization as we know it.